everybody. So tonight we're going to do wound cleaning and closure. Um, I'm Jason. I'm the uh, Flint and Steel Colorado uh, Mountain Instructor. I'm Jeff is also out here mm -hmm. Flint and Steel Colorado. Jeff is going to be performing the uh, video tonight. I'm going to be the tripod, the cameraman, and I'm just going to so I can get in nice and close. Um, if you have any questions, make sure you ask in the comments. I'll field the questions as we go and Jeff will answer them whenever he can. Um, let's see, uh, make sure, you know, if you want to read more about Jeff, check out our, his profile on flintsteelcfg.com and check out my profile and you can look at all the other profiles from all the instructors and also check us out on Facebook, obviously, um, you can find everybody's profile on there. Uh, you ready, Jeff? Let's do it. All right, so Jeff's, Jeff's ready here. Um, uh, stop running my, my gums here and I'm going to... Be the cameraman. Sweet. Hey guys, so I'm Jeffrey with Colorado Mountain Man. Uh, as Jason said, I'm a paramedic. I've been a paramedic for about three years. Been an EMT before that for about 10 years. And uh, that whole time I did search and rescue. Uh, I work really busy urban areas, so a lot of experience with this. Um, wounds in the backcountry are probably the most common injury that you'll face. Uh, a wound can be anything from a really small blister or a blister that's forming to a burn from a uh, you know, from a stove burning or a campfire, uh, and of course, most commonly, lacerations, slipping with a knife or a hatchet, things like that, catching a finger, things like that. So, some of the stuff that we can't talk about, or that we can't take care of in the backcountry, tetanus, things like that, you should just have inoculations for that. So, before you go to the backcountry, certainly any expedition length, anything like that, um, make sure you have your, uh, your tetanus vaccination. I think it's every five years now. So, with wound closures, we've got one big purpose. So all of the closures we're going to talk about today is after the bleeding has stopped. So if someone is still bleeding, <clears throat> excuse me, if there's heavy bleed, bleeding going on, then we're not worried about closing that wound, we're worried about stopping the bleeding. So direct pressure, pressure point, pressure dressing, tourniquet, elevation, whatever you have to do so you stop that bleeding. So <clears throat> your buddy was playing around with a knife, doing some camp stuff, and he cut his arm. And it was a pretty heavy bleed but you control it pretty quickly. Uh, you put a pressure dressing on there, let's say four hours ago. The bleeding is totally stopped. Uh, he has no neurological deficits. In other words, he can move his fingers and there's a pulse. And just, to, just what you see all the time, a nice clean laceration in the back country. So, but for this, you're three days into a 23 day hike around the Annapurna circuit. So we're not gonna evacuate this guy. We're not gonna stop our, uh, our big expensive guided hike uh, overseas or whatever it is. Uh, we're going to take care of this ourselves. So the number one thing here is that we've stopped the bleeding. So the bleeding has been totally controlled. There's no more bleeding, maybe it's a little bit of capillary oozing, things like that, especially as you start getting in there and irrigating, you'll see some more bleeding. But this is uh, a technique that we use after the bleeding has stopped. So this could be four hours later. So you put the gauze on, you put your pressure dressing on, no tourniquet needed because the, the pressure dressing controlled it. So. We let, your, we let your buddy relax and chill and hang out. Four hours later, we decide we're gonna take a look at this and see if we can close it in the back country and hopefully stay in the back country. So for this example, you're hiking in, uh, wherever I said, Peru or Asia or whatever, but it could be something as, uh, as, as bad as like being in a disaster situation and there is no definitive care. You know, you call 911 and the cell phone, the, the phone doesn't work. So you've gotta take care of these yourself. So the biggest thing we're gonna be worried about here is removing any potential contaminant from the from the wound site and then bandaging it in a way so we can consistently reassess it. So a word here about sutures. Um, <clears throat> I see people always talking about sutures. Uh, I work in a, uh, a pretty advanced trauma facility uh, up in a really mm -hmm. nice ski town and my protocols let me do pretty much whatever I want. Uh, sutures, things like that, staples, whatever needs to happen. Uh, I am not at all a proponent of sutures in the back country. Uh, like I said, I'm a paramedic, I know how to do them. Uh, I do not believe in doing them. Uh, you're gonna take an injury that is not bleeding, so it's not a life threat anymore, and now you're gonna start poking holes in there. So you're gonna see how nasty this, uh, this donated deer shank is, uh, just contaminated with gross material. So again, we've stopped the life-threatening bleeding or the potentially life-threatening bleeding, and now we're worried about this infection. So what are we gonna do in the back country? but get our needle drivers and a suture out there and poke 20 new holes in them, totally not indicated. Um, 
Uh, a lot of the wilderness medicine texts for physicians even now are really recommending against sutures for that exact reason. You have to carry a lot of specific stuff, it's a lot of weight, you can get an infection, and now you have to deal with an infection that you caused because you poked a hole through there. So uh, I don't carry sutures, I don't like them, I don't recommend them for anybody. If you're an advanced level practitioner, uh, physician, PA, whatever, and you like using sutures, be my guest, you know what you're doing, just make sure you're bringing the right stuff. Uh, for the lay practitioner, don't just buy some of them off Amazon and think because it was the cheapest one that that is the most appropriate suture for the situation or that you're going to know how to place it properly without causing nerve damage. So, um, so I don't even discuss sutures at all other than to say I don't like them, don't carry them, don't bother with them. So alright, so we've got our, our arm here and our buddy somehow another slipped and had a nice clean incision here. So. There we go. Hey guys, while he's cutting that, uh, give us a shout out to where you're at. We like to know how far our reach is going and who's you know who's watching us, where where you're at. So just let let us know what state you're from. So you slipped with your knife, or your buddy slipped with his knife, and there was all kinds of crap on there because you're in the back country and you're stabbing your knife in the ground. And you're not using it or, or whatever. So now you've got all this stuff on here. So you approach his wound, uh, of course. I know everyone out there is watching and saying, especially my EMT and paramedic friends, that I gotta get my freaking gloves on. So I will do that right now. So. So for this procedure, I would actually recommend even wearing some goggles or some, uh, some safety glasses. Uh, as you're gonna see when we irrigate it, you get a lot of splash off. Uh, this is obviously dead tissue, so it's not gonna be, uh, have that capillary ooze that a real tissue will. But you just get a lot of like aerosolized mist of, of water and whatever you're using. So, all right. So we've got our BSI on. We've stopped the bleeding a little bit ago. We take the pressure dressing off. We're taking it off really, really slowly. We say, yep, all right, it's not bleeding anymore, man. Let's see if we can clean this up and uh, maybe hang out in the backcountry a little bit instead of having to evacuate. So the first thing is some of the high-risk injuries that we're not going to close uh, for a... Uh, animal bites, any deep puncture wound, we really don't want to close that. Uh, just a little bit of moist gauze in there, moist into saline or the best water that you have. Uh, let that stay moist, it won't close, and that's probably an evacuation time. If you get bit by a, a cat somewhere, you, you want to go see a physician and get some antibiotics. Uh, that should be a very rapid uh, evacuation. But whatever the injury is, we can still clean it and protect it. Uh, so for this, we, this is not a cat, but it's not a um, it's not an animal bite. It's not, it didn't have uncontrollable bleeding. In other words, it stopped pretty quickly. And that word, there's an artery down there that we nicked. Uh, and it hasn't penetrated too deeply. So when you look at the wound, another thing I want to say about this, this is not a fun procedure uh, to have done to you or even really to do to somebody unless you're like inflict inflicting pain. But you have to get in there. Uh, one of these tiny little particles here is enough to cause a deep infection. So you really have got to just, uh, you got to make it happen. So the very first thing we're going to do is get all of the gross contamination off there. We got some gravel. We got some, you know, maybe we're cutting some uh, some meat earlier. Chunks of foreign debris. So I'm just going to pick that up there really quickly. And again, the person's not going to really like you too much for doing this. It's going to be a painful process. But by now, some of the uh, that swelling will happen, and some of those chemicals will be there that will help with that uh, that pain. So we want to clean this with copious amounts of fluid. Uh, you want to use the best water that you can get. So some things that we don't use, uh, I've seen people use uh, hydrogen peroxide a bunch, rubbing alcohol, things like that, iodine. Um, those things are not really indicated. They can cause more damage than good. And I say that, and I know people say, well, I've used hydrogen peroxide before, never had a problem. So I'm not saying that it's not going to work or that you're going to put hydrogen peroxide on and immediately fall down dead. Uh, just the gold standard in treating this stuff in the emergency rooms, wherever you go, is going to be using um, high pressure irrigation with, we'll use sterile saline just because we have so much of it on tap, uh, so to speak, but you can use even uh, tap water in the hospital. If someone is able to walk and they move and they've just got like a nasty hand laceration, we'll walk them to the sink, turn a bunch of water on there, and just try to get that water to flow in there as much as we can. Mm -hmm. So for this scenario, we're in the back country though, so we don't have a sink. Uh, we do have our Ziploc bag filled with filtered water. Uh, if you really, really, really just want to be using a little bit more stuff, uh, you don't need to, you just need water, but <clears throat> if, if you really wanted to use something that you brought with you to help clean this wound, there's two products I'd recommend, and don't mix them together. 
The first one is Johnson Baby Shampoo, the uh, No Tears formula stuff. Although it doesn't really work. If it gets in your eyes, it still burns. But just a little bit of that in here will just lower the surface tension on that water. So whenever you go to irrigate this, you're going to have all that bacteria and all that nastiness is going to float out there a little bit better. Uh, if you're going to use that, make sure that the last thing you do is rinse it well. You don't want to seal that stuff in there. And the other one is iodine. Um, usually it's tincture of iodine. Uh, what mm -hmm. I recommend in a bag about this big. So this is an exact dose. Um, I get one of the, the, the iodine wipes. It's about this big. It comes in a little packet. Not the rubbing alcohol, not the chlorhexidine, but the iodine. So the nasty orange reddish stuff. I'll take one of these. This is for example, this is moleskin, but for example, and just drop it in however much water you have. If it's 500 milliliters, 800 milliliters, it doesn't really matter. It's going to take on a little bit of a color, like a light tea or light coffee, and that's uh, that'll work. Uh, again, you don't need to do that. I'm just saying if you really want to use stuff, or if it's a really nasty wound, or you really are deep in the backcountry in Asia or something, and you want to be 100% sure, uh, go ahead and put some iodine there if you want to. Uh, use some of the uh, the Johnsons in a different container and you get all the gross contamination up there. So, but for this, like I said, water just works fine. So we've got some gauze using my thing here and we've got a basin to drip this in. So with a real person, you want this to be going downhill. So all of that contaminant will flush out and then it will just, uh, it'll be out of the wound cavity and it'll be on their body and you can get it off a little bit easier. So just nice, slow strokes, don't be afraid to interact with the wound, that's what you're going to have to clean, you know. Our mission here isn't to clean just the skin near it. Our goal is to really clean the wound and subsequently to that, clean all the nasty tissue around there. So again, this is kind of a painful thing to do, but such is life. So just get in there. 4x4s work really well for this. You can get the corner in there. They make uh, those little surgical scrubs, so on one side it's really fine. Um, bristles and the other side is a sponge that works really well for this again um, if uh, since we're not talking about numbing the wound uh, you're you're really going to cause a little bit of uh, discomfort when you start scrubbing in there but you got to do what you got to do we got to get all these pieces out here oh. so as I spread it apart you can see there's more stuff in there so one thing I definitely recommend is bringing a headlamp uh, you can just do so much wound care and patient care when you're wearing a headlamp, and you should have one anyway for your 10 essentials. So this wound looked kind of clean, but now you look at it, there's all kinds of nasty particles in there. I'm not sure if you can see it, but just take my word for it. All kinds of particles in there. So let's squeeze this out. Get some more water. <laughs> yeah. uh, when you're doing this, there might be little uh, pockets of fat that come out, little blobules kind of. Uh, it just is what it is. It was damaged. They're going to come out. All that stuff has to come out uh, for us to properly close it. So the next thing we're going to use is high pressure irrigation. So this is a 60 cc syringe. You can get these at pharmacies. Talk to your physician. Uh, they're not controlled or anything. Uh, I usually use an, what's called an angio catheter, which is a soft plastic cut catheter that we'll use for intravenous uh, access. But people said they couldn't access that or they couldn't get a hold of those, so no big deal. We're not going to use that for that. But if you can, talk to your physician, see if you can get like an 18 gauge angio cath, uh, and then they'll show you how to remove it. What you want is the part that stays inside the vein. So it's a big needle with an outer plastic sheath, push it through, and the little plastic straw stays in their vein. If you've been in the hospital, you've seen that before. That plastic part is what we want. So you can screw it right on there, and have a nice flexible straw, you can get it wherever you want it. But the most important thing here is pressure and volume. So don't be shy with doing this, and don't be shy with the water. It could take liters and liters of water to do this, but right now you've got a nice, happy, compliant patient who does not have any life threats, he's not bleeding anywhere, and uh, he has no infection. So take your time. Who cares if it takes an hour to do it? Uh, I've read all kinds of formulas, you know, 70 milliliters per centimeter or whatever. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, but for a cut this big, that's probably maybe 12 centimeters long, something like that, maybe a little less, yeah, 10 to 12 centimeters. Uh, so I'm just gonna irrigate all that crap out of there. So if it takes me 10 syringes, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, it's so much easier, like everything else in the back country, hypothermia, other injuries. It's so much easier to take care of the infection right now when we're cleaning it, 
rather than after we close it and in four days you've got this nasty pus filled red swollen freaking thing there you got to take care of so just bluntly dissect it get it in there and irrigate it out really well like I said with that flexible plastic catheter you can get in there a little more deeply but the most important thing is a lot of water so you can see it splashes everywhere that's why I recommend glasses uh, so start at the top work your way down and spray not just the wound channel itself but all around it so wound cavity right there yeah, so we'll open this up some We'll just go through here. You can see the different, uh, uh, not compartments, but layers of fat for here. You won't see that in a human, obviously, because there's going to be skin covering it, hopefully. But uh, when, it, when you open it, it will definitely look like raw meat. So, all right, that looks pretty good. Um, again, this is for just demonstration, but in real life, I'd probably use five or six more of these syringes. But you get the point. You suck water up. Put it in there, use a lot of high pressure, let it drain out. So now when you're doing this, you might dislodge some of the clots that formed earlier and, uh, and it might start bleeding again. That's totally fine. That's exactly what we want. Um, if there's pressure coming out from those capillaries and veins, pushing a little bit of blood there, well, that's exactly what we want. Nothing is getting pushed in there. That's exactly what we want. The body is helping us flush this wound out. So let's see. It looks pretty good here. Um, now we're going to close this wound. Um, we talked earlier about closing wounds and, and when and how, but there's two big types of closure. There's a definitive closure, which is what we're going to demonstrate here, and then a closure where we're essentially packing it with moist gauze and keeping it moist so that it doesn't heal. We don't want it to heal. We want it to be a nice, open, fresh injury with no scab. So when we hike out two days later, we go to that urgent care or our PCP or whoever it is and they take a look at it and say, wow, this injury looks like it just happened. I can close this and give you the definitive care that you need. Uh, for deep wounds like that, sometimes we'll use internal sutures and then external sutures. Again, not what we're going to discuss here, but uh, just understand mm -hmm. that if the wound is really, really nasty or if it's really, really big or if it's very, very deep, you're not going to be able to close that yourself. Uh, so what we're going to do for that is pack it with... 4x4 four four gauze that is nice and moist and clean, not this one obviously. So if this is a much deeper or a bigger cut or really, really when it cut, it split everything out. You just every day when you do your wound dressing changes, you get some sterile clean 4x4s, four four nice and moist, pack it in there, wrap it loosely and transport them like that. Then when you get to the hospital, they'll remove that stuff and the wound will be totally fresh even if it's been a few days and they'll be able to close it. But that's not the case here. What we have here is a nice, clean, simple laceration that's been all cleaned. Um, if there's any pieces of obvious dead flesh that are just hanging off there, go ahead and snip those off. Um, it's, uh, it shouldn't really hurt because the tissue should be dead. So if it's alive, you don't want to be surgically removing anything. But if there's just like pieces of dead stuff there, you can tell the tissue is going to die, go ahead and snip it off. Uh, dead tissue being trapped in here. Is, uh, is, is not what we want. That can uh, lead to the growth of bacteria. So we're going to blot all around it and get it nice and dry. All right, so we now have our clean wound. There's no more bleeding, maybe a little bit of capillary bleeding. Uh, while we're getting everything else ready, what I'd do, just put some more cold water on here and then just put that right on top. So if it bleeds a little bit, that's totally fine. It'll just keep it protected. It's got this moist gauze here, so nothing's going to fall in there. So we've protected the injury. And uh, let's talk about some closure options. So there's a number of products that are available. This is one that a lot of people use called Steri Strips. So if you go to the hospital and get uh, uh, a soft wound closure, they'll use something like this. Or if you get surgery, they'll use something like this. So this one, uh, there's all types of different sizes. This one has, I think, eight, six strips. Each strip is one half inch by four inches. So you get six of them here. These things are not cheap. I don't know how much they were. I usually just get them from the hospital if, I'm, if that's what I'm using, but uh, a few bucks at least. So we'll work with these and you can see them. But what I recommend, uh, these are single use and they don't have any other purpose other than closing a wound. 
Uh, instead of that, carry some Micro Four Tape. So you want to zoom in really close on here. So this is called 3M Transpore Tape. And as you can see, hopefully you can, it's got a number of, uh, it almost feels like it's got a little uh, texture to it. Um, of course, I'm not going to be able to get this off right now. So the patients are bleeding to death here. Right, we'll get it. We'll get it. I get a few more hands. Have a All right, there we go. So as I was saying, so as you can see there, hopefully you can. Uh, it's really, really porous. So there's um, you know, maybe in one inch, there's maybe a hundred little dots in right there. Uh, if you go to the hospital and get an IV, and uh, and if you don't have any allergies, then they'll use this on you. Uh, it's designed to breathe. So this is the exact same material that you have in stereo strips. So one pack of stereo strips, six of them maybe five bucks, something like that. I, I don't know how much they cost. Uh, and now instead you've got one roll of tape that was probably two dollars and you've got, uh, these are 20 feet long. So one inch by 20 feet. So a huge amount of material and you can use it for anything else. So if you have a really cheap line uh, for getting stereo strips, go ahead and stock them. But uh, I think this, this method is a little bit superior to that. So we've got our micro pore tape and we know that we've got a fairly narrow incision here, or laceration, so we're not going to need any huge pieces. So I'm going to say we're going to do about four inches. So about four inches. And what I'm going to do here is just tear off some strips here. So actually I'll tear off a little. So here's my piece of the micropore. So it'll tear directly on the line. Uh, of all those dots, let's see. And stick it on the table. Yeah, sweet. So just stick these somewhere. You know, this is not going to be as clean as stereo strips, but it doesn't matter because we know how to clean wounds and we can take care of it. We're going to be assessing it. Uh, so I just tear two or three of these at a time and stick it on something clean. Side of a first aid kit. If you have a uh, a Pelican case that has your medical kit in there, that'll work. So just tear some of these strips off here. So, all right, <clears throat> so what we want to do is a technique called approximating the wound, uh, specifically the wound edges. So you can see this wound is opened up here. Uh, it's all cleaned out. What we want to do to minimize scarring and to minimize potential of infection is to pull this wound as close as we can to the way it should be allowing a little bit of space in there for any fluid to come out or for any swelling. So we're going to push that to pretty much where it started. And now we're going to do, this is the, the important technique here, stereo strips or whatever you're using. You're going to apply these wound closure strips on opposing sides. So as you can see, the wound dressing, this one here is on the left side and I've got a loose tail here on the right. And now we'll do the exact opposite. So, and in real life it is this, it is this complicated, uh, and it'll come off the skin, things like that. It just is what it is. So, all right, so it's important to appreciate here, from the top, we have these paralleling each other, kind of a crisscross, and the tails are, they're, they're, that's the opposing part. So now we pull on this, you can get a good approximation of the wound, how it should be, and then we seal it. So leave, there isn't much space in between those two there. I would leave a little bit more space than that. Um, it's not gonna hurt anything. You just wanna make sure that you're, uh, that you're leaving, like I said, enough space that you can assess and see if any nastiness starts oozing out there in the next few days. So we'll come right here. There's a product called Tincture of Benzoin that uh, I usually do not carry, but uh, some people do. And it is uh, it's a little cotton applicator with this gum on there. So same thing, I'm just pulling tightly, opposing, and I'm pulling that wound right back in position. And then I close it there. A little bit of space there, you can address that. So that tincture of benzoin, it will come in a little single applicator with a cotton swab, and it's a dark reddish, gum looking material. Uh, one of the reasons I do not like that is because people start putting it inside the wound that is not its indication. 
Uh, it is used on the outside, so here's the injury, so maybe an inch away on each side, you put some of that and it's a sticky tar paper kind of material. So you've got all that tincture of benzoin all around there, and then when you put these strips on, it adheres to it a little better. Uh, if you have it, that's great. I usually don't use it. Uh, I've just done so many of these, so probably many thousands of these closures that uh, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, it's a little bit harder here because that material is wet, but you can totally do this with, uh, without using that tincture of benzoin. And if you have some, that's cool. Use that too, but I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't go out and spend any money on it. So we've got four of these on there now. So opposing edges, a little bit of traction, put where you want it, and seal it. So that's basically the process. I could put a few more on there. Um, the way you want to do this though, leave a little bit at the top, just a, uh, a centimeter or so, again for any drainage, and the same at the bottom. So you go to the whole way to the bottom, do the same thing. When you're done, you can take a piece of the one inch and just put it right down there. So if you can see it, the wound is right there. I'm just holding those edges down really. All right, so we started this scenario off with somebody getting injured, and we used maybe some 4x4 gauze. Uh, it bled through, so we used an ace wrap and some tape. So we're down 4x4 gauze, ace wrap, and tape. Then we closed it, again, with nothing but water. You can use this syringe again if you want to, you know, make sure you clean it if there's any gross contamination on there. Uh, and the catheter, of course, you want to dispose of, but you can use a syringe again, so you can bring this and use it as many times as you need to, as long as it stays clean. Uh, and then some tape. So we bring tape anyway. We use this tape probably in our pressure dressing. So we didn't bring anything specific or exotic or advanced practice. Uh, expensive is a big thing for me. Uh, but we closed this wound really, really well. So when you look at it here, you, you probably can't sit and zoom in. But those edges are pulled in really, really nicely. And that's holding it on there. How far apart would you say you put each set of strips? I leave maybe... It's hard to really say, just a small, maybe a third of the width of the Steri strip that you used. So you want to have a little bit of space there so you can see what's going to go on, or what's going to happen in the next few days. So the thing that we always talk about here is uh, reassessing our interventions. So even if something is fairly benign, is using tape to close a wound, you mm -hmm. want to go to their distal, meaning farthest from the injury, uh, appendage or hand, whatever. And, uh, and just make sure that they have CSM. That's a phrase you'll see a lot in the medical community. It stands for circulation, sensory, and movement. So when you're done bandaging, you say, all right, man, do me a favor. Let me see you blow your fingers. All right, can you feel me touching? Yeah, I can feel you touching me. Check a quick pulse. Just making sure that we didn't change anything by doing this that could have altered uh, uh, you know, his circulation or that we bandaged it up wrong, something like that. Uh, when you're done with this, you can again, and it's totally appropriate to bandage this, uh, we've closed this, we've got a closed wound here, we want to protect this. So trauma pads, anything sterile, sterile 4x4s, four um, just, I keep using that phrase a lot, a 4x4, four four, the medical term. So sterile gauze, 4 inches by 4 inches. So you'll hear a lot of times, give me some 4x4s four four or a stack of 4x4s, four four uh, this is what a 4x4 four four is. For wound closure, they make little packets that almost look kind of like this, uh, that have a bunch of 4x4s four four in there with a peel-off lid. Uh, that works really well because you can just pour water in there and then just grab the 4 by 4s as you need to. So we've got a closed wound, we've assessed the CSMs, now we're going to use a dry piece of 4 by 4 and we're going to put this right on top of the wound and then just wrap gently. Uh, if we had it splinted earlier with the SAM splint or immobilized because of the pain, uh, or if, you know, if we were concerned with an orthopedic injury, something like that, you can splint it again. Splinting is a great way to get, a pain, get rid of pain because it lessens the risk of re reopening. Um, there's 
two main types of skin that we talk about with closing. Tensioned skin or high tension skin, kind of your knuckles that get used a bunch and the skin pulls on whenever you close, whenever you make a fist. Uh, and then non-tensioned skin, so a forearm. So no matter what you do, you're really not going to be flexing that too abnormally that can pop it open again uh, as compared to a laceration maybe right here in the side of the hand. If you move your hand, uh, if you, you really do want to isolate that one because the more they move, uh, your, whatever you've done is going to come off, it's going to reopen, uh, and it's just not, not really worth doing that way. So uh, tape it, splint it, make sure it stays immobilized. Um, okay, so now we've got a bandage on there. We're going to reassess this, I would say twice a day. So every 12 hours, Q12. So you're just going to take this, remove the pressure dressing, take a look at it. And this is exactly what you want to say. It really sort of works out really well. So a little bit of pink exudate is on here. Uh, just the stuff that's coming out of there. There's no redness. There's no swelling. Some of the things besides that you want to watch for, any red streaks going up the arm, sort of from the injury to the heart, be very, very cautious about that. It's probably an infection. Um, but we want to catch that even earlier. So let's say that we look on the first day and it looks okay. And then the second afternoon for our second uh, check in the afternoon, um, so our second check of the day in the afternoon, we take it off and the stuff that's oozing out of there is not light pink. It's kind of nasty looking. So we're like, all right, well, that sucks, man. Now we got an infection again. Let's take care of it. So if you had sutures in there, now what are you going to do? Re re take the sutures out? No way. So uh, all of the stuff peels off. Set it right back there. Guess what we're going to do? We're going to finish what we did. Maybe not incorrectly, but incomplete, incompletely at least the first time. So we're going to reopen this. And this is really going to suck because there's probably some infection on there. It's really going to hurt. Uh, if this happens to you, and it's happened to me, just remember that as we're causing all this more pain and damage and uh, using more materials, it's because we didn't clean it properly the first time. And you just got to own the mistake and, and fix it. But no big deal because we still have our syringe, still have our baggie, still have a water filter. So now we open this and we can see that there's a little bit of localized swelling. So just a tiny little bit and red around the edges. And as we do it, we can see a little bit of uh, pus coming out of there. And as we look, maybe this part, so this is farthest away from me, I look and I'm like, ah, you know what? I was being kind of lazy there, or just didn't do it a good job. Now there's a few more pieces of material there. That's probably where this infection has come from. So what am I gonna do? Best water that I can, high pressure irrigation. Finish the job that we started the other day. So we're gonna open this up. Da, 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 da. Uh -huh. Get all that material out of there. Get all that nasty infective goo out of there. Uh -huh. And when I'm done, same thing. Blot it dry, get my roll of tape out, re cut the tape, and reclose it. So, again, with the Steri strips, they're really, really good products. It's just you gotta pay a lot for them. And they come pre cut to whatever size they are, so you better hope that's the size you need. Uh, with tape, you can cut it to whatever size you want it, however long, however wide. So, with this, we've got our same roll of tape we used like not even a foot of tape yesterday. So now we can pull this out again, make some more closures, reclose this whole thing. Uh, if you are using something like Neosporin, uh, make sure they've been exposed to it before. One of the things, uh, I really do not carry Neosporin. Uh, Neosporin, also known as AAA ointment. Uh, AAA stands for triple antibiotic. And one of the three antibiotics there is gentamicin. And gentamicin is a really, really potent antibiotic a lot of people will have reactions to it, either uh, localized or systemic. So it's better to clean the wound than to try to use, uh, uh, you know, it's better to clean the wound properly and irrigate it than to just rely on a neospore and whatever it is uh, saving the day. People can have reactions to that stuff. So if you've used it on yourself before and don't have a problem with it, uh, I have no problem with it. But just be aware of that. Uh, those medications in there, specifically gentamicin, uh, can cause some problems. And you'll see things. Uh, they'll sell like just bacitracin ointment because some people are so sensitive to gentamicin, it'll just be the bacitracin. Um, I'm a big fan of just cleaning the wound properly, assessing it a few times every day, making sure it doesn't get infected again. If you like Neosporin, go ahead and slather some on there. So we'll do the same thing. It's been cleaned. Tape it back up. Close it properly. Fresh bandage. Boom. Reassess it. Keep watching it every couple of days. Hopefully that should get the uh, infection out of there. For pain, ibuprofen. 400, 800 milligrams, whatever the bottle says, uh, that's, anybody can get that stuff. So uh, the biggest thing we're going to be concerned about for analgesia is inflammation. 
So if you want to ice it a little bit, you're more than welcome to. Uh, if you want to take some Motrin for uh, the anti-inflammatory dose, 1600 milligrams, um, then that, that's a pretty good plan to, um, I wouldn't, if you have advanced scope, I, this would not be a narcotic situation, I wouldn't think uh, at all, really just ice, ice and ibuprofen, uh, elevation if you need to. So that's basically how you close a wound on an extremity or the torso where there is controlled bleeding. Uh, if you're dealing with a finger or something like that, I would be even less inclined, which is already 0%, so less than zero, to use sutures because you can really damage a lot of these structures here. Uh, when you're dealing with finger injuries, there's a lot of compartments in your hand that can get infected or swollen, and as that swells, as that, swells that can really create a threat to the limb. So you want to be, in energy, any injury, you want to be very, very diligent, but fingers especially, they're really, really sensitive. People will say, no, no, that's clean, no, don't, don't, don't spray anymore, it kind of hurts. Just you, you got to be the provider here and, and tell them, look, this is what we got to do. And we got to put, you know, a whole bunch of fluid in there. Same thing, close it, splint it, um, and then assess it every couple of days uh, or twice a day. Um, some other injuries, uh, blisters. Uh, I don't have any de demonstrations of that right now, but I'm sure you've had blisters before. So we like to get those blisters before they become a problem. So whenever you have a hot spot, uh, that's a great time to use mole skin. So... Uh, a lot of these injuries you think about, and it's like, man, that's not really, I mean, a blister, that's not a life-threatening injury. That's not as cool as a, a sucking chest wound or a nice, you know, evisceration or whatever if you're into trauma like I am. Uh, but having blisters all over your feet because you have new or, or mountaineering boots, and you're, it's your first time maybe wearing mountaineering boots, which are hard plastic torture devices that you put on when you go into big mountains. Um, now you've got blisters all over your feet. How are you going to get up there? How are you going to summit? How are you going to finish the loop hike that we're on? So I recommend if you are kind of the, the guy in your group that's in the medic or the, the medicine, mm -hmm. um, the group medic, expedition medic, whatever, uh, check people's feet and hands every day and make sure they're clean. Uh, blisters form on hands, especially with gloves on, but uh, feet are what we're going to be, you know, mainly we're concerned with. So make sure that their feet are dry. Make sure they're changing their socks frequently. Make sure that their feet aren't getting nasty and all trenched foot looking. Uh, all of that wrinkly, like, white skin. That's not what we're going for. Keep them dry. Keep them clean. Um, but if you start to feel a hot spot developing, that's the time to stop. So if you're out with your friends and you just laced up your boots and you're walking, don't be afraid to say, hey, guys, we got to take a five. Let's take a hydration break, foot care break. i got to get my stuff taken care of. Uh, putting on a piece of mole skin when it's, a hot, when it's just a hot spot takes no time at all. Dealing with a big, nasty, freaking pus-filled blister is a huge issue. And that could cause, we've evacuated people with search and rescue uh, specifically because they have black blisters so bad. Excuse me. All right, so a lot of you carry this stuff in your kit. Uh, I carry it myself. Uh, I also like duct tape. So this is called mole skin. Um, this is not made from the skin of the mole. I have no idea where the name came from, but that is not where it is sourced from. So if you look at it, it's got like a felt kind of consistency on one side. Let's see, can you see that? Or you need some supplemental light. Extreme close-up. <laughs> but go ahead and give me some light. All right. So go, yeah. it's kind of a felt consistency on one side, and it is sticky on the other. Um, this stuff comes in strips. It's usually like four inches by six inches or whatever. That is not a single dose application. So you do not need a piece of mold in that big. If you put that in your boot, you're going to have blisters everywhere. So you just want to take this, cut it to the size, and put it over the hot spot. So I want to make sure I'm clear on that. So you're totally covering the hot spot here uh, because that changes uh, as the blister progresses. So you peel this off, and you, it, nothing, nothing crazy about that. You got a hot spot right here in your foot. Put it right over there. Put your sock back on. You should be good to go. Make sure your feet are nice and clean and dry. Let's say that you don't take care of your feet properly or someone in your group doesn't, and that blister starts to develop and really mature into a blister that has a, a roof, as we call it, and there's liquid in there, that uh, whatever that fluid is. So there's two ways to deal with these blisters. If they are two centimeters or smaller, then we'll take our moleskin. How much overhang to the hot spot? Mm -hmm. Oh, just cover around it. You know, if it's uh, 
um, a couple centimeters on each side, I'd say. So if the hot spot is like that big, then I'd use it about that big just to make sure it's totally protected everywhere. So, all right, so now we've got a blister that's less than two centimeters. So we want to try to protect it uh, and not let it pop. So we're going to take our moleskin and our scissors. We're going to fold this in half, roughly in half. We're going to fold it. So, okay, there we go. Perfect. So and we're just going to cut a piece out that's the size of that blister. So what do you advise for a disinfectant in the bush? Alcohol, potassium? Uh, for water or for just cleaning wounds? Um, don't know. Cleaning wounds for water or for cleaning wounds? Michael. So, so if you're going to be disinfecting... For wounds. Yeah, so if you have... I would use... The standard that I use is the best water that you have. So if someone else is injured, uh, I'd get their water bottle and they use their stuff. Any water that you filter is going to be good to go. And really, even if there's a, uh, a stream running next to you, let's say that for some reason you don't have a water bottle, which is bad planning on your part, but uh, there's a nice, beautiful stream uh, untouched up in some alpine territory... Totally okay to use that. The biggest thing we're trying to do, what's that state phrase? Uh, the solution to pollution is dilution. So even if we're taking this water that certainly is not sterile by any means from this stream, but we're using a huge amount of that to irrigate through there, the most important thing is that we're taking that virus load or the bacteria load that's in the wound and we're dramatically reducing that exponentially, you know, logarithmically, thousands of times of, uh, of mass of water going through there and irrigating that through. So, good question. So, now I've got our moleskin with a little cut off here. That's kind of a weird shape. That's just, the, you know, size it to the blister. So, now you're going to put it on, <coughs> excuse me, and just protect that wound. So, we've got a blister two centimeters or less. It's starting to rise up a little bit. It's developed a roof, so there's that pus layer in the middle. And you just want to protect all the tissue around it. So, I've got kind of this previous injury here. The joys of being on the outside all the time. So let's just say this is my foot, and you can see that little bit of red tissue right there. I had a burn a few weeks ago from the stovepipe. So I've perfectly cut that to size, and I just put it right down there. Uh, I would trim this a little bit, so just around the edges so it's not that big. But essentially I've got a nice padded, friction-absorbing material all around that blister. So let's say that you've got a blister that's a little bigger than that. Two centimeters, uh, which is about a half an inch. Let's say it's bigger than that, so you've got a big honking blister about the size of a quarter on the back of your heel. Uh, this is a really common one, I think, and uh, people treat them all sorts of ways, and I think there's the, uh, the, people will get so used to treating it one way and never seeing an adverse reaction that they think that, we're, that the way they're treating it is the way it should be treated. So uh, I'm going to teach you the way that we do it uh, in uh, search and rescue and, and hospitals, things like that. So bigger than two centimeters. You want to rupture it and then cut away all that dead tissue. So what I recommend, if you've got, uh, you know, so this is, let's just say on the, on the table, you know, just so we can visualize it. You've got the little blister here. So take a sterile or a very, very clean sewing needle, and you can sterilize that just with a cigarette lighter. Heat it up till it's red hot. Obviously let it cool. You don't want to cauterize anything. Just want to make sure it's disinfected. You can rub it with an alcohol wipe or whatever. Lance the blister. Press on the the, uh, the roof of the blister to expel all of that fluid that's in there, and then treat it like a soft injury. So get all the moisture off there, and then take a small pair of scissors and just cut the blister material away. So I know a lot of people will say they want to leave that blister material is on what we call the roof of the blister. They say they want to leave that on there. Really recommend against that. Um, what we're trying to do is minimize friction. So you've got your skin here that got irritated. It forms a protective blister. Uh, we lance that, and now you have this flap of skin just hanging there. So uh, what you'll usually see if people do this and they don't take care of their blisters properly, they'll rupture inside their shoe, which is gross, and then that blister flap will just abrade and abrade. And then when you take their shoes off, you see these ruptured blisters with rolled up dead skin all around it. Um, that is freaking nasty, and you should you should feel bad if that happens to somebody in your expedition. You should be resolving that way before that happens. Uh, and if it happens to you, then, well, it, you got what you got. 
So take your scissors and just cut all that dead tissue around. It's not gonna hurt, it's totally dead. If it hurts, then it's live tissue and stop cutting it. But all of that white skin that's just hanging there in the blister pod, just cut it all off. And now essentially you have a, uh, a surface area blister, uh, or a burn rather, a superficial burn. So uh, just like a sunburn or whatever. So if you wanna dress it, you can dress it. Uh, I recommend just a piece of, uh, hey, look at that, my tape again. Just one piece of tape over that previously lanced blister. Uh, it will remove the friction that was on there, and it won't let another one develop. Uh, and again, as with any injury, monitor it for any signs of infection. Any other questions about blisters or anything? Don't look like it. All right. Anybody so, have any questions, uh, now's the time to ask. So, as with everything in medicine, there's always exceptions. Uh, the biggest exception to lancing blisters is if it is a blood blister. So usually you will see this after a cold injury. Uh, I just wrote a blog about that, uh, uh, frostbite and cold injuries. So we know because of that lecture that, uh, that it's going to be a, um, these nasty blisters. So you've got frostbite and it started to rewarm. Now you're going to be forming these nasty blisters that look black or red and it looks like a raised bruise. So it's called a blood blister. You do not want to rupture those. Uh, somebody that has those on their feet, um, really, really bad position to be in, uh, just mm -hmm. treat it with, uh, just wrap it gently with gauze and evac them on, their, on your own power. If they can't stand on that, if it ruptures, they can cause some infection. So look, my notes here, see if I'm missing anything. Um, yeah, so any deep wounds, any bite, by the human or animal that punctures the skin should be evaluated by a physician. Um, I'm not going to tell you you should immediately cancel your hike and walk them out that night, uh, but I would get them evaluated by a physician as quickly as possible. Any bleeding that is uncontrolled. So people talk about, back to sutures again, they talk about using sutures to stop bleeds. Um, if that's what your aim is with your medical kit, then I think you should crack this stuff. So what I want you to do is take your suture kit and go outside and cut your garden hose and sew it back together. And when you realize this does not work, then you'll see why sutures don't work for that. Uh, you're sewing a high pressure system back together. Uh, the people that do that are surgeons and they, you will, they have all kinds of materials. They'll occlude the blood flow, they'll use a tourniquet. So uh, at no point should anyone uh, at all really, other than a surgeon, uh, have suturing as part of their bleeding mm -hmm. control algorithm. So we know how we stop bleeding, direct pressure, pressure dressing, tourniquet if we need to, if it's a massive bleed, use a tourniquet first. But uh, in, no, in, in, in nowhere in that algorithm do you see sutures. So don't say for a big bleed we need to sew it back up. Like I said, try the garden hose thing and you'll see why. Um, so the, the best way is just uh, uh, stop the bleeding, take care of the infection, and uh, if it's one of those high risk injuries we talked about, then go ahead and evacuate. Do you have any, say anything about burns? Yeah, burns, yeah. So burns are kind of the same as um, uh, cold pattern injuries. So the first, I'm not gonna to talk too much about burns, but the superficial, kind of the sunburn or uh, uh, grabbing a cup too quickly. So a superficial burn is red, tender, but not blistering. So cool it off, use cold water, making sure we're not gonna to take too much of their heat and make sure we're uh, protecting them from hypothermia in the environment, cool it off, and then just keep uh, wet, cold dressings on there. Just, you know, get uh, the coldest water you can, put on some gauze and put it on there. Uh, that'll make them feel a lot better. Uh, your goal for a, a, an injury like that is just pain reduction. Uh, very, very unlikely it'll be infected, anything like that. The next wound is a partial thickness, or they used to call a second degree burn. So it's gone beyond the skin and it's caused enough damage that blisters are forming. And we know how to take care of blisters. We're gonna assess them two centimeters or larger, we're going to uh, bandage them. I wouldn't put uh, moleskin on a, a burn because there's so much burn tissue around there, but if you have a few small blisters here, uh, just some dry sterile gauze, uh, change it a few times a day. In the process of doing that, eventually the blisters are gonna rupture anyway. Um, any blister, two centimeters or bigger, um, lance it, de-roof it, and treat it as an open wound. Uh, third degree burns are gonna be very, very significant injuries. Uh, the full thickness, the black, charred, waxy skin, uh, you will absolutely have to evacuate them. And the best way to take care of that is just to uh, cool them and uh, sort of ABCDEs, we talk about that, and monitor the ABCs, treat for shock and rapidly evacuate them. 
Uh, there isn't much you can do for a third degree burn because it's going to have to be fixed surgically. At, at some point, a physician is going to have to do doctor level stuff to that. So um, just make sure that they don't, uh, they don't have any compromise to their ABCs, as we say. Treat them for shock and rapidly evacuate them. Okay, what's your uh, thoughts on using super glue? Super glue. So we've got a tube right here. Super glue is a, uh, a compound called cyanoacrylate, and it is very, very necrotic to skin. Um, whenever I give my lecture about this, every single person says, oh, dude, my friend, buddy, dad, cousin, whatever, uses super, he's a mechanic or a tree worker or whatever, and he uses super glue all the time. Um, I'm not going to say that super glue is going to cause, just like hydrogen peroxide, it's not going to kill you if you put it on a finger injury. Um, but I would recommend not using cyanoacrylate. Uh, it certainly causes problems. Uh, it definitely is necrotic tissue. Uh, so do, do not use super glue, in my opinion. If you do it, well, do what you do. Um, the stuff that I like is called Dermabond. Uh, there's another one called New Skin. Uh, I think Dermabond is a more professional, like, medical setting uh, where, where you find that, as opposed to New Skin, which it just kind of sells at you know, Walgreens or wherever you buy your stuff. Uh, I've seen new new skin or new skin peel off pretty quickly, but Dermabond is pretty good stuff. So if you have an injury to your fingers uh, and you know you're going to be moving your hands a lot, uh, rock climbers will use super glue, which they should not do. But Dermabond works a lot better. So uh, the thing about Dermabond, first off, it's medical it's supplies, so it's expensive, and it's usually single dose. So it'll be a glass tube with a um, a little cotton applicator. You have to break it and mix the solvent with it, shake it a few times. And then when you squeeze it out like a goo, then you can apply it to where you want it. And it does a pretty good job. So same thing, you still want to irrigate it. You still, so the first thing you want to do is stop the bleeding. Then irrigate it, make sure it's as clean as you can be. And then goop some Dermabond in there. Good stuff, I like it. All right, uh, the backcountry suture kits are sold online. Are they snake oil or do they have a use? Uh, if you are a level of practitioner that uses sutures frequently and knows how to use them, then you're not going to want to buy those because you know what you need and you're going to know for yourself, hey, I prefer, I'm not even going to talk about it, but you might prefer oh, a little bit. You might prefer a few dissolvable sutures and a few non-dissolvable sutures, whatever your preference is, but in the back country with somebody that's injured is not the time to like teach yourself how to suture. Uh, and there's, there's a reason that it's a physician level skill, uh, physicians, nurse cracks, some paramedics, some nurses will put sutures in, but for the most part, I'm not a big fan of them. Uh, if you do want to buy something that uh, is pretty cool and it's medical and uh, it's it's not really prescription, maybe sort of, kind of, depending on you know, where you get it or whatever, uh, I like staples. So you'll get a sterile st uh, staple applicator and you can it's got like 10 staples in there. Um, I... I don't want to empower anybody to go out and do stuff like that, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. But uh, if if you, yeah, that that's all I'm going to say because I don't want to tell anyone to go out and buy a staple gun and start <laughs> stapling wounds together. Um, I would prefer staples. I mean, I carry two staples in my kit uh, for head lacerations and things like that. But again, don't. I'm I'm not your doctor. I'm not a doctor. I'm not your medical director. And uh, I'm sure as hell not going to go to court with you if you get sued for doing something that I tell you to. So don't use any of those advanced procedures uh, unless you're trained in them. And I would say never, ever sutures, even if you're a physician. I have physician friends who are not into emergency medicine, and they think it's cool because like, I'm a doc. I can write a script and get sutures. I, I took a class in that in medical school, and I'm like, no, it, totally inappropriate. You can do much more with this. Uh, the only thing that you can do with sutures that you can't with this is harm. You're not going to harm somebody with tape unless they have an allergy, I suppose. But... Uh, uh, just imagine you're putting a suture in somebody and because you don't know anything about physiology, I'm not that good on it as well, and you go through a nerve or a tendon and now you've taken a non-life-threatening bleed with the bleeding controlled and now you've caused an infection or a permanent disability. And for what? Just to say that you use sutures? Not, not a big fan of them at all. Um, get some things like this, and uh, if you're in the back country like I am and like Jason is, somebody's always injured and bleeding, uh, especially when you have kids around. <laughs> uh, so just practice using this uh, and doing those those dressings, and uh, I promise it'll take you way farther than sutures. And I guarantee you, just Murphy's Law, that even if you do decide to like, oh, I'm going to put sutures in so bad, I'm going to go to medical school and become a doctor and get my own suture kit, uh, the time that you have that injury, you won't have that suture kit with you. It's just Murphy's Law. So. 
this is how you close wounds in the backcountry, in my humble opinion. Uh, infected bug bite, like uh, from a horse fly, what would you do with that? Yeah, so a, uh, any of those things we look at uh, on the abstract from like a general perspective, we essentially have a potential envenom envenom envenomation, which probably not likely from a horse fly, but uh, it could be. So we're going to make sure the patient isn't having any breathing problems, things like that. Go through our primary survey. And now essentially we have, so I've seen these before, you get a horse fly and it gets kind of infected, maybe a little bit necrotic looking. Spider bites will do that too, even if it's not a uh, quote unquote poisonous spider. Uh, so what I like to do for that, warm compresses, warm saline compresses, any infected wound that you can't open or irrigate, uh, warm saline. Uh, just put it on there for 20 minutes, two or three times a day, and it will help. I've seen people say it draws the infection out. It doesn't really draw the infection out. Uh, it facilitates more blood flow and it allows that stuff to drain. So uh, do not open things in the back country and you know, let's pop it and see what happens other than the blisters we talked about. Uh, but infected horse, bi or horse bite, uh, horse fly bite, uh, warm saline, that'll kind of loosen up the scab. It'll get to a point where it just drains on its own and then you can, uh, uh, you can just squeeze all around there and drain all that pus out of there. It's pretty nasty looking but it feels pretty good and you have an infection and you just see all that nastiness coming out. And then just treat it like an uh, open wound. So once you've got all the, the infection out of there, clean it as best as you can. Uh, it's probably not going to be a really deep penetrate or a deep puncture. So, uh, I mean, it's, you probably can't even be able to see through the skin. Uh, so go ahead and irrigate it. Get all that nasty pus out of there. And then uh, dry it, dry dressings, pack it. And uh, I would say that's probably not even uh, an evacuation. Uh, just keep an eye on it. Make sure the infection doesn't spread or get worse or become systemic instead of localized. Hey, uh, one more question. Isn't closing the wound with glue dangerous for infection leading to gangrene? It absolutely is. Uh, really good question. When we use super glue on something, so you guys remember when I put that tape on there and I pretended there was an infection, it took me like two seconds to reopen that injury. Uh, if you have super glue on there and you didn't clean it properly, uh, you should have a plan for that. And I don't know what it is really. That, you're ripping the infection out and pulling out beats of uh, super glue or Dermabond. Uh, really good point. Totally agree with that. Um, I carry Dermabond really more for like facial cuts uh, instead of fingers. But for the most part, uh, that's a really valid point. And I would still recommend closing it just with, uh, as we discussed, clean it, irrigate it, and use uh, stereo strips or tape or whatever you're into. If I got the opportunity to learn from a real surgeon how to suture, would it be better than trusting on stitches? No. Because the surgeon will probably tell you just not to do it. He'll probably tell you that you should uh, you should use closures like this. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions. Do you have any more you want to talk about? Nope. Thanks for thanks for hanging out, guys. All I appreciate right. it. All right. Uh, flip you around here. Whoa. Uh, I don't, don't know if I'm pointing at me, but thanks for joining us tonight. I think we went well over an hour. Uh, be sure to share this video with everybody. I think we got quite a bit of good information on here. We'll be back next week. Um, I'm not sure which one of us is doing the next week's feed. It'll be same time, same bat time, same bat channel, or something like that. So 6 o'clock Mountain Time, 8 o'clock Eastern. Um, be sure to uh, share everything we have on our Facebook page. We're trying to build, yeah, we're trying to build, uh, you know, our network and get as much information we have out there. We've got instructors all over the country, so if you need to know uh, somebody to teach classes in your neighborhood, we can help you out with that. And uh, if you're interested in taking a class with Jeff, keep, uh, stay tuned on the Flint and Steel page. We'll show you um, soon on our calendar a woofer class that's Wilderness First Responder. That's a seven-day class in Wilderness First Aid. That's a two-day class, and both of them are certified woofer and woofa, so you will walk away with a certifi sorry, with a certification. Um, but that's it for tonight. I'm going to flip the phone around here real quick to see if there's any last questions, and then we're going to go have dinner. All righty. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. We're going to go eat some venison. Mmm, rare venison. Some dirty venison.